Hi everyone, it's Jack here back with another video. Today I'm going to be talking about Abvi, major pharmaceutical player, spin off from Abbott Laboratories in 2013, now actually marginally larger at $245 billion market cap converted to 229 for Abbott. Maker of Humira, the world's best selling drug, and it has been for several years. Also owns Botox, which had gotten an acquisition from Allegan a few years ago. Big dividend pay and excellent performance into the spin off. Excellent performance over the last five years. You can see up 128%, not including dividends. It's a really interesting company. I want to analyze it a bit deeper. So I'm going to look into the financials, the balance sheet, do a DCF, look at some basic valuation metrics, and then look at what I think for the future of Abbey because it's certainly got an uncertain future, to say the least. First things first, with any company like this, particularly one that's known for Ben's dividend, you need to have a look at the balance sheet, have a look at that debt position, the cap position, and its profitability to metrics. So debt is worrying here. This absolutely needs to be mentioned. Big red flag and almost turned me off to this investment completely. Cash debt ratio of 0.15 is a poor position to be in. The company has around $74 billion in long-term debt, which did decline 10% year over year, so I'll give them some credit that they're paying it down. About half of this can be traced to the acquisition of Allegan in 2018. It's not unusual to see pharma companies have a lot of long-term debt because they're very acquisitive. But let, make no mistake, this is a, this is a poor posi debt position. Debt to equity and debt to EBITDA are also really concerning of these, these numbers. This is all summarised by a poor Altman score of 1.68, indicating that this company is on the borderline of being in financial distress and is not well positioned at all to withstand tough market environments. Dividend could come under pressure in high interest rate environments. This is a company that could really struggle. Interest coverage is okay at 7.06, but this is already a slight red flag to me looking at this positioning. High debt requires skillful management and strong cash flows to manage well. Fortunately for AbbVie, it has excellent profitability metrics and excellent cash flows. Recorded around $17 billion in free cash flow most recently. 31.65% operating margin is absolutely excellent. 13.66% net margin is also very strong for this industry, particularly in pharmaceuticals. That means 13.66 cents for every dollar of revenue they take home in pure profit. Return on equity percentage of 55% is some of the highest you will you will see and one of the highest I've seen analyzing companies. Truly outstanding. And it's actually not that strong for Abby's historical comparison. So 55% when it's kind of one of your weaker numbers, it's really, really impressive. Return on assets of 5% is okay. Not great, not bad, just okay. I would probably expect this for a company of this size and it's not doesn't overly impress me and it's definitely not as impressive as that return on equity figure. Overall, the debt positioning is because Avi are acquiring aggressively to get around the loss of patent protection on Humira, which we'll talk about in a minute, and they're trying to, to they're trying to buy extra revenue and extra growth, which I kind of admire them for, but that debt positioning is certainly worrying and it's something that is going to be hanging over Avi for many, many years to come. Taking a deeper look at revenue and gross margin, last 10 years, revenue up and to the right still remains strong, decelerating a bit obviously, but that this is to be expected for a company of this size. Interestingly, gross margins declined quite a bit. Still high, like in this, in this above sixty five percent, but it's declined from highs of above eighty at some point in around twenty fifteen. This was perhaps due to pressure on drugs like Humira going out of patent protection. Very much the cycle for companies like this. Pharma companies require really strong pipelines as companies as best selling drugs go out of patent protection. They need new ones to take the place, and this is again a long term concern for Abvi. Humira is such a such a success that eventually it will go out of patent protection, which will happen in twenty twenty three, and they'll have to replace this enormous amount of revenue. And that is a real worry for Abvi, and is going to be a recurring worry throughout this video for Abvi's future. Looking at some valuation metrics, the first one that jumps out is of course the P/E ratio. P/E ratio of thirty three is above the S and P average and it indicates growth assumption, or that this is a company that's held at premium due to its strong dividend record and strong cash flows, which I could kind of believe. I still think this that is maybe a little bit too high. Luckily, the forward P/E ratio of nine point nine is very very low, and that's because it's growing EPS at a stupid rate at the minute. It indicates the future EPS growth for Abvi is not being priced efficiently by the market at all. Avi, as I mentioned before, has excellent free cash flows, and this is why I don't think the company's high death load is an absolute death sentence for the company's growth. The company is currently trading at a price to free cash flow ratio of only around 11. This is positively cheap for a company of this size. I mean, that is an excellent, excellent price to free cash flow ratio and just shows the strength of Avi's free cash flow positioning. And again, why why it won't be a complete death sentence for the company's growth that is high, high long term debt as long as it can maintain its cash flow at such high levels. Of course, basic valuation metrics are not really enough and we need to do a discounted cash flow calculation to calculate a fair value based off the sum of its future cash flows. This is a really tough one and it's kind of murky waters with Abvi. 
Earnings per share and free cash flow calculations are giving wildly different metrics. And this is to be, to be expected because free, the earnings per share figures are kind of all over the place and free cash flow has been really consistent. For a company of this size and maturity, I tend to prefer using free cash flow in my calculations. If I use the 10-year average earnings per share growth, Abvi is far overvalued relative to its fair value, over double fair value of $63 compared to a current day's present day start price of 139 that is absolutely terrible that is an investment i wouldn't touch with a barge ball when using the 10-year average free cash flow Abvi is significantly undervalued with a hundred percent up upside if i use 13.3 percent which is the 10-year average free cash flow the truth is that dcf is not a perfect metric and requires a degree of foresight if Abbey does not adequately replace earnings from humira and add and add growth on top of that then 13% free cash flow growth is wholly unrealistic. Even, they manage, if, even if they manage to replace Humira, that level of free cash flow growth over 10 years may be too difficult. Assuming a more conservative figure of 5% growth gives a fair value of $180, which is food for thought at least because it's still significantly above the current present day stock price. Biosimilars for Humira will be available in 2023 in the US. There are, Abby have some technology for manufacturing that is protected until 2024, so perhaps Abby can get some licensing payments or slow the storm, but this is definitely concerning. I don't think it can carry on increasing its free cash flow at 10, 10 13% rates while he, they're under such pressure from Humira and the, the other drugs in the pipeline are just not adequately providing revenue. As you can see from the chart below, Humira is an awfully large percentage of revenue. These are just quarterly numbers, but Humira is 35% of all net revenue for the quarter. Already declined internationally due to biosimilars, you can see it's down 9% for the year. Rimvolk and Skyreasy, if that's the current way to pronounce them, I'm not sure, are potential blockbusters that Abvi is predicting combined greater than $15 billion in sales in 2025. This year, Humira did roughly $20 billion worldwide. Only time will tell here if Abbey's pipeline growth is strong enough to outpace the decline in revenue from the loss of protection on Humira and if immunology will continue to be a strong strength for the company. Abbey recently announced that the FDA approved Rimvo for treatment of moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. This is the third FDA approved indication from Rimvo, so this is definitely bullish and both of them are growing at tremendous rates, 68% for Skyrezi and 57% in the US this quarter. But again, these the numbers are just not there. Seven hundred sixty-one million dollars of net revenue this quarter for Skyreasy and three hundred eighty-two for Rimvoke. That's not even a quarter of Humira's numbers. So we need tons and tons of growth here, and maybe by twenty twenty-five we'll get there. But patent protection's going in twenty twenty-three, so that I can see there being a drop in revenue of Abvi can't figure something out very very quickly. Abvi released its fourth quarter results and its full year report today. Revenues to the full year up 22%, really strong growth at this scale. Immunity portfolio, which is the three drugs we spoke about, was up, was almost half that at 25.28 billion and grew 14% year over year. Humira US net revenues was still up at 7.6%, but down 9.6% internationally. But as we saw overly, that's not really that much concern. US net revenues are around 17 billion compared to 3 billion internationally, so it's it's water in the ocean. Oncology and neuroscience portfolios recorded strong cytolytic growth. Botox portfolio was also nicely created here. This is from, from Allergan. Between therapies and cosmetics, Cosmetic contributed around $4.7 billion. Company is strongly profitable and revenue is, is going in the right direction. I'm not going to go through every single metric here because it's going to be a very long video, but they're going in the right direction. But again, it's all about humor at the minute and if they can replace that adequately, which I don't think from this they're able to do. I keep talking about Avery's really strong dividend, so I'd be, I'd be failing if I didn't show it. Quality dividend went from around $1.15 to $5.52 in just eight years. Chart is slightly off yield. Yield now is around 4%. Clear strength for the business. Of course, the stock price has gone up a significant amount in this time. But nevertheless, dividend tremendous good dividend growth. That's what, like four and a bit times in eight years. Absolutely tremendous. Clearly a strength for the business. But of course, this may come under pressure in the future due to debts. Revenue pressures, as mentioned, can they keep up the cash flows? So I would not bank on this being a safe dividend stock for the next 10, 20, 30 year retirement. So would I invest in Abbey at these prices? Bluntly, no. It's on my watch list and it's going to continue to stay on my watch list, but it's firmly in the too hard category right now. I think this is very much a company in flux. I'm really concerned about the, the loss of revenue from Humira, which is certainly going to happen in the near future. I don't think it's blockbuster drugs are going to make up the revenue in time. I think it's going to struggle for growth. It's going to struggle to maintain its free cash flows. 
and it's going to struggle to pay its dividend effectively and it's going to struggle to pay down its long-term debts which are very very high and are a looming spectre over this company that being said this is an excellent company that spends a lot on r&d and is very successful at doing so i'm happy to be proven wrong here because i think this is an excellent company and i'm not totally throwing it away because it's on my watch list i just think even at 11 times free cash flow I'm just not happy pay, paying that for this business considering the, the overhanging risk. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't because I think this is an excellent company. However, none of this is financial advice. It's just my opinion. If you want proper financial advice, you should go to a registered financial advisor and do your own research. With that being said, subscribe and like if you're enjoying the videos. Thanks.